Okay, welcome everyone to the Arlington Heights Memorial Library Online. My name is Barb and my co-host tonight is my colleague, Allison. We are both librarians. Our program tonight is Wills and Trusts with attorney Jacob Aronsaft. Mr. Aronsaft is going to wait until the end of the program to answer all the questions. So thanks everyone for coming and I will now turn it over to Jacob Aronsaft. Uh, thank you, Barb. Uh, so uh, this is the Wills and Trusts program. Uh, the program tonight will last about an hour or so, and at the end of the program, I'll open it uh, for questions and answers. Um, but of course, what else can you expect from a lawyer? There's a little bit of a disclaimer. Uh, this presentation tonight is for informational and educational purposes only. Uh, nothing in this program is considered legal advice. Um, and I realize today's program is on wills and trusts, but usually before I speak about wills and trusts, I like to address what most people are generally coming to me to avoid, and this is what is referred to as probate. Now, if you're very familiar with the probate process, I'm sorry, uh, but if you're not, probate is essentially the court process for distributing a deceased person's estate. Now, with probate, it's not to say that there is necessarily litigation, there could be, but if you die and you own any real estate in your own name, or if you have $100,000 or more in total without listed beneficiaries who survive you, probate is going to be required. And the reason for probate is um, state of Illinois, much like many other states feel if you have at least a minimum amount of money or real estate, Creditors need to get notice. Um, they're in, still entitled to be paid as well as your taxes. Uh, just because you die, your debts are not erased. And also your heirs, the people who would legally be entitled to inherit your money if you do not have a will or trust or anything of that nature in place, have the right to receive notice. And probate's not the end of the world. It's not always as bad as people make it out to be. Sometimes people tell me, well, I don't wanna to go to probate because that means the state takes all of my money. No, that's not the case. It sometimes may feel like it, but um, no. But I would say probate on average, if you plan to avoid it and do it correctly, it's usually much cheaper. Uh, if you go through probate, pricing I'd say is about three to five times the cost uh, that you would pay to uh, correctly plan with an attorney to avoid it. And also there's the lengths for probate because probate takes a minimum of six months from the time you open the court probate estate until you close it. Not six months from the time of the person's death, it's from when you open it. I should also point out that today's program is during uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus and for people who want to open or close probate estates or need to do something aside from an absolute emergency. Most of the court processes are uh, slowed or non-existent and they will continue sometime I'm sure in the near future, but probate is taking a lot longer to open or close cases uh, for the time being. So I always tell people, I think probate is a good thing to avoid. Many of my clients would like the money to go as quickly and easily and cost effectively to their friends, family members, charities, et cetera. Um, but as I said, uh, probate's been around for a long time. I envision it'll continue to be around for a long time. Now, sometimes people will tell me, well, I don't really care about my money when I die. Of course, if that's the case, I'm not entirely sure why you're watching a program on wills and trusts. Um, however, there is something most people are much less familiar with and probably which is much more important and this is referred to as guardianship specifically guardianship for disabled adults and guardianship is the court process for appointing an individual uh, referred to as the guardian to make decisions on behalf of somebody else could be healthcare decisions only financial decisions only or both now, most people have probably never thought about becoming disabled, um, or if they have, they'd presume that, oh, well, perhaps my husband or my wife could make decisions for me, maybe my significant other, um, perhaps my adult child could make decisions for me, or maybe I could make decisions for 
my adult child who's living at home, maybe going to school or working, right? Well, unfortunately, too many people find out this is not the case. Um, most of Americans' wealth are in things like IRAs and 401ks. And while you might have a beneficiary, somebody who gets it when you die, that does not mean that person can necessarily access those funds while you are still living or make your healthcare decisions. And guardianship, unlike pr probate for uh, decedents estates or people who have passed away, guardianship lasts from the time somebody is permanently disabled until their death. So if somebody is disabled and has not properly planned ahead and they're disabled for 10, 15, 20 years, that's 10 or 15 or 20 years of ongoing court costs, attorney fees, accountings, and if you want to do anything out of the ordinary, sell a house, move the person who is disabled to a different state, you're going to have to get court approval for every single major decision that is out of the ordinary. If you don't get anything else out of today's program, you really do want to avoid guardianship. Um, even beginning it, the process requires a doctor's note, the person who is disabled, needs to be served by the county sheriff. They're interviewed by a court appointed lawyer. And then if they can realize what's going on, they have the right to show up in court and contest it. So it's not a really fun um, process for the person who is disabled if he or she knows what's going on. It's not fun for the friends or family. There are oftentimes disagreements over who should make the healthcare decisions, where should this disabled person be living at home, uh, perhaps in a facility, et cetera. And also, and usually the area of more contention, how should the money be spent, invested? You can completely plan ahead, but you do have to do it correctly. Now, I like to call this program Wills and Trusts, or Wills, Trust, and Estate Planning Basics. This area of law is oftentimes referred to as just estate planning. And a lot of people find the word intimidating. They assume that if they don't have millions of dollars, estate planning is not for them. But really an estate just means everything that you own. I've done estates for, estate plans for people who have had $2,000 and have been on Medicaid. I've done plans for people who have had $20 million and the range of people with estates in, in between. Even for somebody who doesn't have any money, if they're above the age of 18 and can still make their decisions, they should probably at least have a power of attorney for healthcare, as you will see later. Now, estate planning is not just about who gets their money when you die. Yes, that's definitely part of it, but that's not the only part of it. Estate planning is really a process where individuals can determine who will make decisions on their behalf if they become disabled, who will make their health care decisions, who will make their financial decisions. If you have minor children, who will care for them? Where are they going to live? Go to school. Who will manage the money for them until they're adults? And then also, yes, who will receive your money, your house, your other property upon your death? Will they receive everything at once? Will they receive a stream of income? Will they receive it at different uh, points and times in their lives, like different ages? And also, are there any people in your family that you want to make sure do not inherit it? Sometimes it's just as important to exclude people as it is to include people or um, charities, friends, organizations, etc. Now, the basic state planning documents are wills, trusts, powers of attorney for healthcare, powers of attorney for property, and living wills. Now your individual estate plan may include some or all of these forms and perhaps even some forms that are not included. But basic estate plans usually include most if not all of these plans. Some more complicated ones may require um, different forms, but I'm trying to hit on what affects the general population. I'll begin with what I think is easiest and move my way on to what I think is most complex. And I'll try to give a few examples along the way. So the first form I'm going to speak about today is a living will. A living will does not have anything to do with who gets your money when you die. 
a living will is a healthcare form. And it's a document where somebody refuses medical treatment if he or she is suffering from a terminal illness. And these came in the news a number of years ago, if anyone can remember a young lady named Terry Schiavo. She was in her late 30s, early 40s, probably never thought about dying, let alone becoming disabled. But she was in a coma for close to a decade, with her parents arguing in the court systems that she should be kept on life support, and her husband arguing through the courts that she should be taken off life support. After close to a decade, she was eventually disconnected from life support, but after a lot of time, money, and grief on this. And a lot of people said, well, only if she would have had a living will, this wouldn't have been necessary. And that's ultimately possible in that case. If she would have had it, maybe it would not have been. Now, does everyone need a living will? No, it depends on what your wishes are. Some people may want to be kept alive if they had a terminal illness, um, but it's a question for you individually. Even some of my clients who come in as married couples, sometimes one spouse has it and one spouse does not, but usually most of them do. Now the next and probably the most important form I'll be speaking about today is the Illinois Power of Attorney for Healthcare. And this allows you the ability to appoint somebody to make healthcare decisions on your behalf. And it prevents guardianship, at least for healthcare decisions. Now you can name one person at a time to make healthcare decisions for you. You can say my first choice is my spouse, my second choice is my child, my third choice is my brother, my fourth choice is my friend. It can be anyone who you would like it to be as long as they're adult and capable of making decisions. But I always warn people, it doesn't matter how good your attorney is, how good his or her forms are, it's usually up to the client to provide the right person for the job. Do not automatically choose somebody just because they're your spouse or because it's your oldest child. You need to make sure that this person is emotionally capable of making the decisions that you would want them to make for you, um, not just how old they are. Does this person have some kind of medical training? Um, you know, if you have two children and the younger one is a nurse and the older one is an accountant, the nurse might be a better choice. Also, unlike any of the other forms that I'll speak about today, how close they live to you is also an important consideration. You, closer is usually better if everything else is considered equal. This person might wanna see you in person, might wanna meet with your doctor, um, etc. So really give some thought about your power of attorney for healthcare. And realistically, this is the one form everyone who's 18 years old or older should have if they're capable of making their own decisions, uh, whether they have money or not. Um, otherwise, you would have to go through guardianship. Now, the next form I'll be speaking about today is the Illinois power of attorney for property. And this is where you can appoint somebody to make financial decisions on your behalf. And it prevents guardianship for financial decisions. Now it is much like the power of attorney for healthcare, only one person at a time. You're not supposed to have two people acting together. You can have a first choice, a second choice, and a third choice. And the reason for this is Illinois does not want people to have planned ahead and still um, get at an impasse like Terry Shiva, where you have one person saying X and one person saying Y, you need to name one person at a time. And of course, that person can always speak to your doctor, your family members, your financial advisor, accountant, etc. but they want one person to make the decision for you. Also really consider with these forms, the age of the person you're naming. Um, I have a lot of people name their children, that's usually fine, but with people living as long as they do, I sometimes have people who are in their 70s or 80s by the time their parents are deceased, and it can be very difficult for somebody at that age to 
handle an estate or make these decisions. So these are things that you need to periodically update over time. Also, today's theme should be don't wait until it's too late. I always get the question, at what point in time in my life do I need to do a will, a trust, powers of attorney for healthcare, property, et cetera? Is it maybe when I get married, when I have my first child? Is it when I retire, when I have my first grandchild? For those of you who have seen me before, the answer still remains the same. You should start doing estate planning after you turn 18 and before you die or become disabled. If you can let me know exactly when that's gonna happen, by all means, we can do it the day before, but realistically, this is not something you wanna put off. And unfortunately, a lot of people do, and this is a good segue for an example. So a few years ago, I had a couple come in to me to do a relatively simple estate plan. Um, they were doing a will and powers of attorney. And I called them and I said, well, your estate plan is ready to um, be signed. When can you come in and sign it? And the husband told me, we'll come in in about a month. I asked him, why do you want to wait a month? You've already paid for it. Why don't we get it done? And he said, well, we've got a few appointments closer to your office on that date. And by the way, next week, my wife is going in for some minor surgery. And I said, minor surgery? And he said, no, don't worry, Jacob. It's just outpatient procedures, no problem. Still repeated, I really think you should get this done. You never know. And he said, thanks for your concern, Jacob, but we're gonna wait. Four weeks later, I got a call from him. Unfortunately, not the call that I wanted. Um, he said his wife was at home recovering, but there were some complications, had to go back, had a few more surgeries, and now she's in a coma. And the doctors are in the hospital are asking for her power of attorney for healthcare. And by the way, the only money she has is a few hundred thousand dollars in her IRA. But Jacob, you've already got those forms completed. You know what she wanted. Can't we use them? Absolutely not. She had not signed them, so they were not good. So even though we had things ready to go, had to go into court, get a guardian appointed, and after about two years, she passed away. Fortunately, on her IRA, she had listed beneficiaries. Unfortunately, those listed beneficiaries were her deceased parents. It's not enough to just start your estate planning. You really need to finish the process. Otherwise, this will not work. And I also tell people um, an estate plan is not something that's meant to be put away for 20 or 30 years and that you never look at it again. Too many attorneys approach this area like, here's your will, here's your trust, your powers of attorney, call me if anything changes, and you probably have never heard from them again. I like to call my clients every few years and ask them, hey, has anything changed with you? And by the way, there might be a change in the law that might affect your plan. People have paid an estate planning attorney to keep their plans um, in place to make this an easier process for them and their family and their friends and their other beneficiaries. And keep in mind the attorney to update usually gets paid and the client gets a smooth and easy transition if they've done everything right and planned correctly. And sometimes people will tell me, well, I did everything correctly. I did a number of years ago, nothing's changed with me. Well, even if that's the case, things may have changed with the law. I'll guarantee you if your powers of attorney older than July 1st of 2011 in the state of Illinois, they do not comply with the current law. And there were a number of changes that happened on this date. For the power of attorney for property, they revoked prior powers of attorney. And what does this mean? Well, you'd assume if you did a power of attorney for property in 1990, and you did another one in 2000, the one in 2000 would be the only one that's good, right? Unfortunately, that's not the case. They could both be argued to be uh, applicable. The newer ones say, I've intentionally 
uh, or I revoked all prior powers of attorney. This new one is the only one that's good. There's also a cover page. Cover page is supposed to give you some idea of what you are signing. It's not necessarily the easiest thing to read. Um, however, it does say that you're allowing somebody to make financial decisions for you. Um, you don't have to sign this form. Of course, if you do not, it's not going to do anything. If you have questions about this form, you should ask an attorney to explain it to you. Also very important were changes to the power of attorney for healthcare. And the major um, change was compliance with HIPAA or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. So what is HIPAA? Well, HIPAA is federal privacy law. It used to be when you went to a doctor or a hospital, they handed you a sheet of paper, it said something like, uh, we cannot release your information without your prior written consent to anyone. These days you get a small little screen, you check I've read it, no one ever reads it, but that's what it says. So if you have a power of attorney for healthcare that's older than July 1st of 2011, it's not completely useless. You may still be able to have somebody make your healthcare decisions. However, under federal law, that hospital or doctor who is treating you cannot release any of your medical information to the person who is supposed to be making your decisions. A little problematic to say the least. Now, some attorneys did something called a HIPAA release, and sometimes you'll see on very general things that you should have a HIPAA release. No, you should just have an up-to-date power of attorney for healthcare. You do not need one if you have the correct form. It's also important to note there are sometimes some other forms that go out that sometimes doctors recommend or other people who are not lawyers, uh, but a lot of those forms do not comply with HIPAA. So you do have to be very cautious. And sometimes people will tell me, well, I did mine after 2011 and I'm fine, right? Well, perhaps not, because the power of attorney for healthcare was updated yet again, January 1st of 2015. Now, there have been a lot of recent updates. Uh, keep in mind the power of attorney for healthcare and property were not updated for more than 20 years prior to um, these updates. But the power of attorney for healthcare uh, really was a good update. And the reason for it was a lot of attorneys, myself included, really felt that the old form was too difficult to read. People are oftentimes getting a power of attorney for healthcare. They're in a hospital, a nursing home, hospice, end of life care. Um, and if you really take the time to read the power of attorney for health care for the updated form, it's really pretty simple. It's meant to be more efficient and simple, and it asks a number of good questions, such as what do I want my agent, the person who's making decisions for me, to know? Uh, what decisions can my agent make? Who should I choose as my agent? What do I do with this form? and what happens if my agent does not act. And this is a good point where I can also point out not all lawyers are created equally. When you're doing your estate planning, the most important thing is to really retain an attorney who really concentrates in this area of law. It'll be the best thing you can do for yourself, your friends, your family, and any other beneficiaries you may have. If you choose to do nothing at all, probate has been around for a long time as well as guardianship, they will continue to be around for a long time. The worst thing I generally see people do is using an attorney who does not focus in this area of law or trying to do it themselves. A lot of times people will assume, well, this is good enough, I can do it myself, or maybe I can use the attorney who did my real estate closing or my bankruptcy or my divorce. Realistically, that person does not have the knowledge to do it and do it correctly. Even if it's a very simple plan, they can go very wrong. And trying to undo a plan that's been done incorrectly is usually, in my experience always, been much more expensive than if somebody had done absolutely nothing at all. I've had years where 20 or 30% of my income is trying to undo some plan that somebody did themselves on the computer or that they used an attorney who really just did something to make a few bucks or they felt like they needed to because it was their friend or family member. And now I or somebody like me has to try to clean it up. 
And let me give one very good example of this, and unfortunately not something I, uh, that is uncommon. A number of years ago, I had an attorney who was acting as a witness for a will and trust and power of attorney side. A few hours later, I got a call from his office and he said, Jacob, I haven't seen those powers of attorney before. Would you mind giving me a copy of those newer forms? And I said, well, sure, as another attorney, I know I'd be happy to provide you with the correct forms, but that meant for the last five or six years, all of his estate planning uh, clients were getting forms that did not comply with the current law. This unfortunately does happen all of the time. And it's not to say that that lawyer wasn't a bright guy, the guy was brilliant, but he just really took on too much. He did every area of law, anything from divorce to criminal law to bankruptcy, estate planning, litigation, you name it, he did it. But really this is an area of law where that person really should be concentrating on. Now everyone can take a little sigh of relief. Uh, we'll get on to simple wills and what those are and what those mean. Most people have probably seen a simple will and simple wills are meant to give beneficiaries their assets outright. So for example, my will might say, I give everything to my spouse if she survives me or if she doesn't survive me, it goes equally to my children who survive me. Now, a lot of people assume if you have a will, your estate does not go through probate. No, most times if you only have a simple will, your estate does go through probate. Perhaps if you are married and you have everything jointly owned, probate may not be required, um, but then if there's a second spouse, uh, when the second spouse dies, usually probate is required, even if you have a will in most instances. And if it does go through probate, information is available to the public. Now, a lot of you are probably wondering, well, what do I need a will for if it's gonna go through probate anyway? Well, having a will that goes through probate is much better than at least a well-drafted will than not having a will at all. Because in a will, you can state who your executor is. The executor is the person who, when you die, is going to be responsible for gathering all of your assets, all of your money. They're going to be responsible for finding out who the creditors are, going to be responsible for hiring an attorney to take your estate through probate, for paying off any rightful creditors, and then eventually distributing the money to the rightful beneficiaries. Also in a will, you can decide who will receive your property and who will not. And even for married couples, extremely important that at a minimum you have a simple will. Now, wills may be adequate for your situation. A lot of times it requires a will and a trust, but it depends. It's a case by case basis. I oftentimes see somebody on TV saying everyone needs a will and trust and this and that. Um, not necessarily. It depends on your individual situation. And realistically, an estate plan is not a one size fits all plan. It's really a custom tailored suit to fit your individual needs and circumstances, no matter how simple or complex they really may be. But let me give one good example of why even married couples should have a will. So um, there was one situation where there was a husband and a wife. The husband passed away and the wife did not realize she was not on the deed to the house. She was not an owner of it. And so the house had to go through probate. And when some, an item goes through probate, that's gonna be subject to the probate laws where you live. Illinois, I believe is very similar to most states. I usually tell people, if you don't have a plan in place, your state doesn't have one for you. It just may not be what you anticipate. And the way probate works, at least in the state of Illinois, is if you are married and you only have a spouse, everything goes to them. If you're unmarried and you have children, everything goes equally to your kids. But if you're married and you have children, half goes to your spouse and half goes to your children uh, with about a $20,000 exception and extra going to the spouse. There are some other rules. I won't go into all of the details if they're minor children, et cetera. But um, what happened in this case was this lady had two sons. 
uh, he had two sons with the husband. And so when he died, the house technically was to go to the half to the mother and half to the two kids. One of the two sons said, sure, mom, I'll sign whatever I need to have my 25% interest in this house go to you. The other son had a little bit of a different idea. Realizing that he, he did not get his inheritance now, he would probably never get it. And he said, I'd like my, you know, 25% interest in the house. Now, as you can imagine, no one really wants a 25% interest in a house. No one's gonna draw a chalk line or tape down uh, a fourth of that house. He wanted the money. And as a one fourth owner of that house, he was able to force his mother to sell that house and get his 25%. And thereafter, the mother and the other son never spoke to him again, but really something to illustrate that yes, you really do need to plan. You never know what the circumstances may be, but it's very important to plan ahead. But I'll explain why um, information available to the public, why that is so important in another few slides. Now, as I said, simple wills, uh, it may be appropriate, it may not. But if you have a simple will, it usually means you don't have a trust. And it depends. You can always have a will without having a trust, but you should never have a trust without having a will. And usually if you have a trust, uh, most likely a living revocable trust, as opposed to it being called a simple will, it's normally called a pour over will, like a pitcher pouring over into a glass. Now these are drafted with trusts and they're usually used to name beneficiaries of personal property, jewelry, furniture, cars, etc., And they transfer the rest of your assets into the trust. As long as the assets the money, et cetera, and real estate, or well, not real estate, but the money going through a will that is not owned by the trust, that doesn't have a name beneficiary, as long as under $100,000, there's no probate. Please don't get too hung up on the difference between a par of a will versus a simple will. If you have a simple will, that's usually your main document. As I said, it probably says, if I die, it goes to my spouse, if not, it goes to my children. A par of a will says, this is who gets my personal property. This is who gets the couch, the jewelry, the car, but I give everything else monetarily to my trust. And then my trust will say, everything goes to my spouse or if my spouse isn't living to my trust. So if you have a living revocable trust, a part of a will is just a supporting document that funnels everything into it. Um, that's the only major difference between the two documents. There really isn't a whole lot of difference otherwise. And on to the most complex uh, form that I'll be speaking about today, and that is a living revocable trust. Most estate plans, uh, whether they're simple or complex these days, do include a living revocable trust. If you have significant assets, there may be other types of trusts or, ever, uh, or more complicated living revocable trust. It depends, but I'm just discussing the basic ones. And the reason it's called a living revocable trust. It's called a living trust because it's created while you're alive and you're supposed to transfer the majority of your assets with certain exceptions to that trust while you are still living. And it's called the revocable trust because you can always change it as long as you're able and willing to make that decision. It's not to say because you said everything is going to your boyfriend or your girlfriend now, that in 20 years, you can't change it if you're no longer together. Um, you can't. Uh, so always consider that. And living revocable trust, there are a number of benefits. The usual ones people are coming to me for is to avoid probate and for protection against guardianship. And if used correctly, this will work, but you still have to use it correctly. You could have a living revocable trust and still have a probate estate, or still have guardianship if you do not use it and or the other forms I've spoken about today properly. And I'll explain why it works to avoid probate and guardianship. At least in one respect, think of a living revocable trust like a corporation. Now a corporation can own things. It can own real estate, bank accounts, 
furniture, etc. And usually the person controlling that corporation is the president. But if the president dies, becomes disabled, or just no longer wants to do it, the corporation does not cease to exist. There is usually a vice president that steps into his or her shoes and continues to run it. At least the same principle can be applied to a living revocable trust. You still control it while you're alive and capable of making your decisions. There are no restrictions on you being able to sell your house or to use your money. You can still do it exactly the same way you're doing it today. Uh, but in the event of your disability or death, your trust doesn't die or become disabled. And that's why probate and guardianship can be avoided if it's used properly. Now, if you avoid probate, this keeps the information private. I'll discuss this in one second. And you can provide income to a beneficiary without giving them control. And let me explain why this is important with yet another example. So I had a few people who called me recently. And the reason of concern was there was a problem with their mother. Apparently, several years prior to this, their father had passed away. He had a number of assets in his own name and a will, but it went through probate. So the information was available to the public. But after several years, the mother or the uh, surviving spouse decided she wanted to move on with her life. And she met a very nice, sophisticated, handsome gentleman. After they had been dating for a number of months, he gave her a very nice, sophisticated business proposition. One that didn't just require some of her money, but one that required all of it. And her kids said, no, no, mom, what are you doing? Don't trust this guy. Uh, what do you know about him? And she said probably what most of our parents would have said to us, or what we'd say to our children, I'm your mother, thank you very much. I think I can make my own decisions for myself. Well, sure enough, she gave him that loan. And then she found out he was truly madly and deeply in love. Not with her, but with her money. He has disappeared. We don't know who he is. We don't know where he is. The money is gone. Now, most people would say, well, a little absurd of an example. Well, not necessarily. Um, I don't say this happens all the time, but happens more than you would like to think. And while everyone says, well, I would never do something so stupid, A, as we get older, we tend to be more influenced by what other people think and tell us. And B, I don't know if anyone who's listening to this could ever say they never dated, fell in love with, or even married the wrong person. Uh, sometimes it happens. And this is also another good note to point out relationships. Oftentimes, if there's a couple, whether you're married, unmarried, opposite sex, same sex, doesn't seem to matter. In most relationships, one of the two people is responsible for handling the money, paying the bills, making the investments. Unfortunately, that's almost always the person who dies first. Now, for anyone who's watching with your significant other, you're probably saying, thanks, honey, I know it'll be you. But all fun and games aside, you've not only left somebody with the grief of your passing, you may leave them with a huge financial responsibility that he or she is going to be completely unprepared for. And most people generally will not ask for help, and the money can be gone very quickly. And this is where we can go to, you can provide income to a beneficiary without giving them control, but you need to let your attorney know this is a concern. I've had people have told me, look, my son is 50 years old. He's never been good with money. He never will be good with money. I wanna make sure that there's enough money to provide for his living expenses, his medical treatment, et cetera, but don't give him a lump sum of money. So you can give that person a stream of income. What if you wanna leave money to somebody who perhaps has a substance abuse problem, drugs, alcohol? You don't wanna give them this money outright for them to blow on that. 
you can certainly have somebody make sure that they have a place to live, but you don't want them to give them the means to, um, well, potentially make them addicted or kill themselves. If you have minor children or young adult children, well, if you die and you don't have anything planned, they will receive all of your assets when you become 21. Now, most of us could probably remember when we were 21, but at that age, if you had received $20,000, $200,000, $2,000,000, would your first thought have been, I'm going to use this money to pay for my education and invest for my retirement? Or would it be more likely I'm going to use this money to take my friends on vacation, maybe bought, buy that nice car that I've had my eye on? Now, I thought I was very responsible at 21, but I also grew up watching uh, some shows, I would have loved to have a red Ferrari. Um, we don't make the best choices at that point in time in our life. And oftentimes, if you have young adult children or minor children, you might say, they'll get a third at 25, a third at 30, a third at 35, and somebody can manage that money for them to make sure uh, their education is paid for, their living expenses, etc. Another important point is, what if you have want to leave money to somebody who's on Medicaid or likely to need it? If you give them money directly, you will terminate their benefits. And after the money is used up, they'll have to apply to go on Medicaid again. Now, I do give programs, but this is not one on special needs trusts. And you could essentially leave money to somebody who is disabled in a special needs trust so they can still receive government benefits, but the money in a special needs trust can be used to supplement the benefits that they are receiving. I've seen this work very well. Um, I know I had one client in particular, she left everything to her disabled brother, it was used to make sure he could go on vacations, field trips, movies, restaurants, have some better clothes, exercise equipment. And if by the time he dies, there's any money left, that money will go to the home where he lives for people who could not otherwise afford it. Because most institutions have a certain amount of Medicaid beds, but the rest are private pay. So uh, this is really a good way of doing it and planning correctly. And let me give one more, don't wait until it's too late. Um, before I move on to the next slide. So I had one client, I was handling his estate planning, or sorry, his brother's probate estate. And we were nearly done with it. And I told him, look, you saw how long this was and you saw how expensive it was to go through probate. And especially in your circumstances where you're not married and you don't have any children and you have a long time significant other, what you want to make sure that she is provided for. And he said, I think that'd be a great idea, but every year we go out of town for a few months and we're leaving in a couple of weeks. I guess if I don't get to it now, I'll just have to live until I get back. Those were his words, I could not make this up. Now, no note to any of you who think that he died on that trip, he did not. But a few months later, I did receive a call and I asked them, oh, are you back in town? Are you ready to close your brother's estate? Um, maybe do your own estate planning. And there was a brief pause on his end. And he said, well, I thought I called you a few weeks ago. I guess I forgot. A few weeks ago, I was having some stomach pains. I went to the doctor and they removed a tumor from my stomach the size of an orange. By the way, could you do a will and trust and powers of attorney and send them to me with instructions so I can take care of it? I said, sure, I can do it. Not the way I'd prefer to do it, but we did it. Um, he signed all the documents. He came back to the state of Illinois. I had transferred his home into his trust. And I asked him, did you do what I told you to do? You only had one bank account. Did you put it in the trust like I told you? And he said, sure, Jacob, of course I listened to you. And I put my bank account in my trust. Unfortunately, six months later, he died and he did not listen to me. He decided to listen to his girlfriend. 
because why would you want to listen to an estate planning attorney when your friends and family members who have never done this before know so much more about estate planning than somebody who does this for a living? Well, she told him, you should put me on as a beneficiary. That way it won't go to probate. But in case something happens to me, you should also include my adult son and my two minor grandchildren. So when he died, the house went to the girlfriend. There was uh, $200,000 in that account. So 50,000 went to the girlfriend, 50,000 went to the adult son, 50,000 went to each of the girlfriends, uh, two minor grandchildren where they can't touch it until they're 21 and they'll get all of it. I guarantee this is not what my client wanted, but it's what happened just because he didn't listen. So don't wait until it's too late. And also you need to listen to what your attorney tells you. A few more notes before I go to the next slide. Now I realize this is during COVID-19 or the coronavirus. It's still completely possible to do estate planning. For everyone who has put it off because they said they didn't have time, chances are you probably have more time now to do it. Um, it is a little bit more challenging to sign it, but it is still possible to do it uh, safely. And even for people who are squeamish about signing it, at very least you can start it and have everything ready. So when you do need it, you can easily sign it. But I've done several signings since the outbreak, um, just obviously with numerous safety precautions. Also, let me point out, I realize there's been a lot of information in today's program. Please don't feel overwhelmed by it. Really all you need when you see an estate planning attorney is you need to know approximately what your assets are, uh, what they're worth, and who you want them to go to. Let your estate planning attorney guide you through this process. You don't have to call the attorney and say, I need a living revocable trust. They'll probably tell you uh, what is the right plan for you considering what you have what you want to do and who your beneficiaries are. A few other things about changes in the law. Um, for trusts, if you have existing trusts, you should definitely have them review. Um, Illinois changed what used to be the Illinois Trust and Trustees Act to something called the Illinois Trust Code as far as January 1st, 2020. There have been a number of changes that definitely affect more complicated trusts, but they affect simpler trusts too. Uh, a lot of it will be during the administration after somebody's death or disability, but depending on how they're written, sometimes even while you're still alive, you may now legally be required to give accountings, tell somebody else, perhaps your spouse or your children or your grandchildren, what money you have and how it's being spent. Um, it's fairly new, but I have been adopting all of my recent plans to affect us and I have been trying to tell some of my clients um, to start you know updating their plans to comply with this. Also in addition to Illinois giving us new updates, uh, keep in mind the trust code was around um, the prior trust code was trying to they were trying to change it for about 17 years so they just decided to do it this year and to make matters a little bit more fun, uh, the Secure Act. So this is a federal law and it affects things as of December of 2019, retirement accounts such as IRAs, 401ks, 403bs. There are some complex rules on it, but the most important and sweeping thing for this was that as opposed to giving somebody who is not your spouse, let's say an adult child, your money in an IRA or a 401k and they could expand it throughout their lifetime, now they usually have 10 years to take that money. So depending on what you've done with your estate planning, your IRAs or 401ks, that advice may change based on this new law. Now it's not to say everyone has to take it in 10 years. There are some exceptions for things like a, somebody like a spouse, minor children, disabled people, et cetera, but it's kind of on a case by case basis. And you do have to be much more cautious um, with this uh, for prior plans. Now comes the fun part of the program, I promise. Uh, you can learn from celebrities. You can learn about what they did so you do not make the same mistakes. First person I'll speak about today is Michael Jackson. 
Uh, whatever you think about Michael Jackson, at least he had a good estate planning attorney. He was previously married and he wanted to make sure his prior spouse did not receive any of his money. So on the first page of his will and trust, it essentially said, I have intentionally not provided for my ex-wife so-and-so. Um, they are to be treated as having predeceased me. Now, every now and then you hear this scenario on the news and some webcaster is making it out like, how could the attorney draft something so harsh, so mean? Every estate planning attorney is saying, yes, that attorney actually knew what they were doing because oftentimes when somebody died, whether you're worth a minimal amount of money or a huge amount of money, if you don't exclude somebody who might be a problem, your estate may have to pay them a significant amount of money to get them to go away. If you have children, it's not good enough to just not state their names in your documents. They can claim that you are not in your right mind, you fail to name them, um, and they will probably walk away with some money. The old way was used to say, I, gave, I give my son a dollar if he outlives me. I didn't forget to name him, but he's only getting a dollar. That's antiquated. It's usually I intended not to give him anything. Good luck trying for him trying to make a claim that they forgot to give him anything when on the first page of your document you said you didn't want to give him anything. Robin Williams. Now, he did some estate planning, but he didn't update it, and perhaps his attorney didn't do a great job. His children already got uh, his money when they became 21. Not a good idea for most of us, let alone somebody with the state the size of Robin Williams. Also, he only had one successor trustee. For all my forms, I tell my clients, yes, you need at least one person to make decisions for you in the event of your death or disability, but I usually like two or more in case something happens to your first choice. He only had one choice for his trust. That person, of course, died before he did. So his estate still wound up going through the court system because uh, his estate plan was not updated. Philip Seymour Hoffman. He gave a lot of money to a lot of great charitable institutions during his life. But he had a simple will and an unmarried partner. Now, a brief note on estate taxes. If you're worth less than $4 million in the state of Illinois, this does not affect you. If you are worth more than $4 million in the state of Illinois, this will affect you, but there are some ways to avoid potentially up to $8 million if you are married and plan correctly. Federal estate taxes don't come into $11 million adjusted for inflation, at least until 2025. And uh, what will happen then, I'll have to see who's in Washington. Uh, your guess is as good as mine at the moment. But back to that scenario, because he had a simple will, wasn't married, even though he gave a lot of money to a lot of great charities during his lifetime, the single charitable organization that received the majority of his money upon his death was the IRS. Michael Crichton, famous author, you're watching, this is part of a library program. You can check out one of his books. He did some estate planning, but he did not update it. He was on his, I believe, uh, third marriage, but he didn't update his estate plan. He died. His trust left everything to a child from one of his prior marriages. To the best of my knowledge, his estate plan gave everything to uh, an unborn child, as I said, from a prior marriage, but his most recent wife was suing the estate on behalf of their unborn child because she was pregnant when he died. Mickey Rooney, old time movie star, I'm a movie buff. Um, and Mickey Rooney, much like a lot of Hollywood stars, was not married just once. But unlike today's movie stars who are married two, three, four times, Mickey obviously could not get enough of a good thing because when he died, he was on his eighth marriage. And he really chose the wrong person for the job. He chose his wife or his wife and her adult son. And what happened was they managed to imprison him in his own home until he was eventually able to escape. And he had his day in court where the judge ruled uh, the money needed to go back to him, but he died before he got a penny of it. If you're on your second marriage, third marriage, fourth marriage, eighth marriage, you really need to think about 
if your spouse is really the right person for the job, especially if you have children from a prior relationship. Um, there's a different way to tackle it or at least think about it. Because if you each have children from a prior marriage or relationship, the spouse that dies and leaves it to the other spouse, usually the surviving spouse leaves it to his or her own family or children. It does not go to yours. There is a way to plan to make sure that does happen correctly. Um, but in this case, you really did choose the wrong trustee. Prince. It's been a while since Prince was in the news. He died and he was not married, didn't have any children. Now, for any of you who know about Prince in the music industry, he was known for being a brilliant negotiator. He fiercely negotiated all of his contracts, but he died like an idiot. No will, wasn't married, no children. Um, I believe his parents were deceased. I think he had some half brothers, half sisters, but it's been years since Prince died. There are multiple litigation suits associated with his estate. There's no will. The only money that's been paid out from his estate, accountants and lawyers. At least some of the money has gone to a good place. Jim Morrison, he decided he didn't need a lawyer. He'd draft his own will, and sure enough, he did, leaving everything to his wife. Now, they had no children. But about six months after his death, she died as well. And remember where I said, if you don't have a plan, the estate does. She did not do a will. They had no children. Jim Morrison's wife, her mother was deceased, but her father was still alive. So within six months of Jim Morrison's death, all of his money wound up going to his father-in-law. Now later on, there was some litigation. Jim Morrison's family did get some of this, but really a terrible job of planning and something completely inadequate for the situation. Aretha Franklin. For years, it was my understanding that her attorneys were trying to get her to do a will or trust or some estate planning, but she was an immensely private person. She did not want to tell them what she had or who she wanted it to go to, etc. Believe it or not, this is not a rare occurrence. Every year I get somebody telling me, I ask them, well, what assets do you have? And they don't want to tell me. And I usually tell them, well, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Would you want to go to the doctor, refuse to undress, and refuse to tell them what ailments you have and expect the doctor to cure you? It's the same thing. Now, Aretha Franklin wound up drafting some wills herself, but just that just actually made it more complicated. We don't know which ones were valid. There were a few different versions that were squirreled away in her house. People have been arguing over who should be the executor, who's getting the money. I believe it is still in litigation. Um, not a great way to do it. One last one. This is a new one for people who have seen this program before. Edgar Bergen. Uh, he was the ventriloquist. He was a famous ventriloquist many years ago, and he was Candace Bergen's father, or Candace Bergen was more popular as Murphy Brown. And this can really be used to show that you don't have to give your children anything if you don't want to, because when Mr. Bergen died, he left $10,000 for the upkeep of his ventriloquist dummy, his puppet, and nothing to his daughter. So really sh shows you what you can do, but also something very hurtful to the family. You really do need to consider how this may affect your family. Even if you have two children and one has lots of money and one doesn't have anything, leaving one child out uh, or giving somebody more money, you really need to think about how this may affect their relationship. Um, it oftentimes can be very hurtful and can destroy families. So really, you need to go over this with your lawyer and see how this uh, could affect your planning. Now, before I open it for questions, one last note. Uh, well, two last notes. A, I'm going to repeat what I said before. Today's program is for informational and educational purposes only. Nothing you heard today is or should be considered legal advice. Somebody asked me a question that's way too personal, or what do I need to do in this situation? Um, I will politely either decline or fail to read that question. Um, 
Also, I know there's one question I'm going to get. How much does this cost? Or can you give me a range? Um, I refuse to. A, this is a library program. I cannot. And B, even if I want to, it's usually not going to be adequate. Usually I tell people, you can call me. I will not charge you for a consultation up to an hour. At the end of it, I'll say, based on what you have, based on what you want to do, this is what I recommend. These are your options. It's half up front and half when it's completed. And the reason for this is I don't really think an attorney can do a good job of, hey, I need a will or I need a trust. Well, what's adequate? You could have two people. Each of them has a million dollars. One lives in an apartment, has everything in a checking account. The only beneficiary is a single charity. The other person has a million dollars, has been married three times, has children from each marriage, one child is disabled, some of that money is invested in a few different businesses with partners. It's like night and day between what you need to do. So you really need to investigate to see what is adequate and what the cost is going to be, even a range. My cost can vary so greatly, um, it just depends. But that's really as fair as I can be. And that's the only thing I will address as far as fees are concerned. So I will start um, taking questions now. Okay. Um, is there a minimum amount of money that does not need to be in the trust? I thought 25,000 could be excluded. Um, so if you have less than $100,000, it will not go through probate or less than 100,000 not in your trust. But I usually tell people you need to see what, um, how your plan should be placed. Uh, sometimes people only put a house in their trust and then when that person dies your trustee doesn't have any money to pay for funeral um, for perhaps property taxes fixing up the house etc so yes that might be excluded but you really need to plan to see what is necessary for your individual plan we've got a copy of the slides no there is no copy of the slides however this program is being recorded you uh, will be up, I believe, at Arlington Heights Memorial Library for a few weeks if you do need to rewatch the program. Okay, is it a common practice to have the attorney and client uh, for an estate planning meetings and execution of the document? via phone and video, and if not, how is it being handled? So um, at least for the initial consultation and the drafts, usually I've been doing it either over the phone or virtually for those people who are able to do that. Um, but the signing is questionable. Many different states have various laws about signing online. Um, Illinois has allowed for notaries for a good month or two now but the probate laws I do not believe have been updated to allow for this and it, even if you could you don't want to really be new to this law usually what I've done for a lot of my clients is um, depends uh, I, I've done it where I've sometimes depending on how close they are gone to their home stayed in my car and told them you know you can stand outside or in uh, as long as I can see you signing these documents and I can notarize them and you have some few witnesses, you can put the papers down, they can come and sign it when you're far, far enough away and I'll eventually get them and notarize them and get them back to you. It's not too difficult, it's a little strange, uh, but there is still a way to do it safely. So, okay, uh, somebody had a great question, one I did forget to address. Um, I'm eight years old, I don't have any friends I trust, so I don't have anyone to 
um, to make decisions with the will or trust or powers of attorney. So if you don't have anyone, um, or even if you do have people but not somebody that you trust, you can always pay a trust company to do this. You might have to have a minimum amount of assets. Usually it's about $100,000 and something liquid. And they will, uh, obviously for a fee, but the fee normally doesn't come until you die or become disabled, um, they can make all the decisions for you. And unlike somebody who's a friend or a family member, they're going to be impartial. Um, yes, they'll be paid for it, but much better that a few thousand dollars are gone than the entire estate being gone because somebody else has stolen it. Even for healthcare decisions, there are some individuals that can be paid. They will interview you um, so you can state. And um, just because you don't have any friends or family members you trust, it's not a good reason to put it away. Almost every estate planning attorney has uh, you know, a trust company that they work with to um, help with scenarios like that. And sometimes even if you do, you know, if you have two or three kids, I always tell people, the more they spend on you while you're living and potentially disabled, the less they get when you pass away. So there's always a potential for conflict. Is there a cost uh, each time to change a living revocable trust? Yes, uh, <laughs> that's the answer. Uh, the cost usually depends on how substantial that change is because usually it involves coming to see the attorney, it still needs to be properly witnessed, possibly notarized, copies made, et cetera, um, and usually a draft. And it depends how substantial that change is. Is it you're just changing your executor, your trustee? Is it you've gotten remarried, adopted a few children, had a few children, you came in initially when you had 200,000 and now you're worth $10 million? Um, yeah, of course there is. Does a living revocable trust predict, protect against loss by creditors and lawsuits? A living revocable trust, usually not. Um, there are ways you can set up trusts to protect your beneficiaries if you give them money. This is not a simple living revocable trust. This is a much more complicated document, but there are ways to protect. So if you give money to, let's say your children, and you wanna make sure that if they get divorced or sued, uh, somebody will not take their money. There is a way for that. If you want to protect your own assets, there are ways to do it. But for most people, it's generally not worth it. It's not something I do. There are some specialized attorneys, but uh, you're going to be talking a very, very, very expensive estate plan with annual fees for somebody else to control it. Um, probably great for people that own chemical companies, uh, maybe people who are neurosurgeons, the vast majority of people usually getting an umbrella policy with your insurance plan um, may only be a few hundred dollars a year and get, may give you millions of dollars of coverage for uh, lawsuits. Uh, somebody's asking, do we need a will or a trust? We have uh, been married, to, uh, been together for 30 years and everything's in joint custody. Probably a will, trust, powers of attorney, but I don't, I don't know. It depends what you want to do. It may be if you have everything jointly and when both of you die, you don't care it goes through probate. Um, it really depends, uh, but it's something that you need to speak to an attorney about your individual questions. Uh, and the additional question is we have no children to the prior one. So if you have no children, a lot of my clients don't, you know, you might wind up stating that half goes to uh, one partner's family and half goes to the other partner's family, or it may be you all agree on charities. Sometimes half goes to, you know, one person's family and the other goes to charities. Um, it can go wherever you, but you just need to decide where it should go. And keep in mind if they're not, individuals you're close to or ones that you think need money. There are a lot of great organizations, especially at this point in time, that could use your money. There are animal rescues, um, alumni associations, your local libraries. There are a lot of great organizations out there. Okay, so I have a question. Um, 
So how is real estate, real property different? Um, presentation mentioned, if there's real estate and portable wills, we can only distribute personal properties. Uh, what issues may exist and or convented with real property? Um, so if there is real property, a uh, real estate, a house, a uh, condo, whatever, an office building, whatever it may be, if you're using a trust, probate will be avoided, assuming that obviously you've named a beneficiary who has outlived you. Um, if, however, the real estate does go through probate, um, it can still be dealt with. It's just going to take longer and cost more. The only other thing that I really do these days, aside from estate planning, is to sell real estate. I don't usually do purchases. Um, and usually be, that's, that pertains to this question too. Oftentimes when my clients die, become disabled, or sometimes they wanna move uh, to a nursing home, a different state, I will sell uh, the real estate. It's usually um, not too difficult if it's done correctly. Can appointed people from a power of attorney for property refuse to accept this role? Absolutely. You could say, hey, you saw this guy named Jacob giving this presentation. You did a power of attorney on your own. And you named me. By no means do I need to uh, do anything for you or accept that role. So you really want to make sure that whoever you have selected um, is able to do it. And that's why you usually want two or more people in case you're first choice is una unable or unwilling to do it. Um, additionally, all beneficiaries are each other and up to date. Well, still a good idea to check that sometimes people assume they have beneficiaries that are up to date and sometimes they are not. Uh, let's see. How do we evaluate an attorney? Um, if you like the attorney, if you can ask him or her questions and they can answer it, and sometimes even the answer is, I don't know, it's better than that than saying uh, you can't do it or I absolutely can when they're not sure. You have to be comfortable with the attorney, like that attorney, and they have to be able to explain things to you in a way that you can understand them and be comfortable with what's being done. Should IRAs and 401ks be in a trust? It depends. Usually they're not in a trust while you're alive, but they may or may not be payable to uh, your trust upon your death. It depends what, um, you know, it depends what your situation is. How do you know if an attorney is a specialist in estate planning? Uh, usually I told people, if you call the attorney and you ask them, hey, what do you practice in? And they say estate planning, that's usually a good idea. Or if you look at their website. Um, of course, if they ask you, well, what do you need help with? And you say, I just need a will done. Do you do that? Most attorneys who do not do estate planning will say, sure. What is the best way to find a qualified attorney besides yourself? Um, really kind of getting outside the scope of this. Uh, I mean, you can, um, I, I, I don't know, see programming on it um, or just ask friends and family members. So what happens if there is no living will? Is there a default regarding medical treatment? If you don't have a living will or power of attorney for healthcare, there's a default, it's called guardianship. A guardian has to be appointed and that person can make your healthcare decisions. Much more expensive and difficult though. Should insurance policies be paced in a trust? Depends on what the goal of your estate plan is, how much the insurance is, et cetera. Um, it's kind of a case by case question. Is a trust only valid in the state where it's created? Um, no, usually trust might be um, valid in multiple states, but when, if you move to a different state, you really should have it looked by an attorney in their state because the laws may be different and um, depending on what you're doing, uh, that may affect your planning. Somebody is asking about thoughts regarding including and living revocable trust that address giving assets and divorce protection for your adult children. 
So um, if you're giving money to your adult children, there are ways to do it where they can receive your money. And at least as far as Illinois law is concerned, they would be protected if in the event of a divorce, assuming they do everything correctly. Where should the will be kept? The multiple, uh, should there be multiple copies? Also, that's kind of, it depends. I usually like them in safe deposit boxes, although I make sure I keep a copy for my files because sometimes uh, people lose them. Somebody is saying, do, I did not discuss quick claim to avoid probate, do I not recommend? Usually, so what they're speaking about is sometimes you add somebody else's name to your deed um, as a way of avoiding probate. Usually I don't recommend. There are, as I said, it's kind of a case by case basis, but there are multiple problems. If you add your child or somebody else onto your house because they can get it when you die, the problem is you've made a gift to them. If that gift is, uh, you know, if your house is worth more than $30,000 and you're giving them half of it, you're supposed to file a gift tax return federally. And if the person that you've named on your real estate is being sued, somebody can foreclose on your house, take everything, um, as well as, of course, if that child or person you've named wants to take it, now they're a partial owner, they could also foreclose on it and take that interest in your home. There are also some other tax reasons I won't get into, but it oftentimes winds up being more expensive, more expensive to just do a quick claim deed for tax reasons. What determines if I need a trust? Um, multiple things. How much money you have? Do you have any real estate? Do you care about your estate going through probate or not? Um, do you have estate taxes, et cetera? Do I recommend a land trust for property versus a living trust? Um, land trust I do use on a very limited basis. Uh, the problem with them is that A, they can only own real estate and B, they can only own real estate in the state where they're created. Only about four or five um, states allow for land trust. Illinois is one of them. The problem is, okay, well, you've sold your house. Now you have $300,000. Well, you can't put that in a land trust. Or you buy a house, you sell your house here, you buy one in Texas. You can't put that in an Illinois land trust. If you have a living trust, you move to Texas, you buy a house, you can put that in your trust that you created in Illinois. Also, if you sell it, you can put the proceeds from in a living revocable trust. Um, cost aside, a living revocable trust is a much more flexible vehicle and usually a better one for most people. Not everyone. A land trust can be used. I usually like them for secrecy. If you're a judge, if you're a celebrity and you don't want somebody to know where your house is, if you open the land trust, and you purchase the house in the name of the land trust, it's not so easy to find out where that person is, but it does not affect them from being sued. Somebody is asking, uh, what if I am currently the sole owner of my condo now that my husband is deceased? Uh, will my two children receive this property if I died? Um, I don't know the answer to the question because I'd have to see the deed. I'd have to see who's on it. I'd have to see if there's a will. I'd have to see there's a trust. Uh, best thing I would say would be to come in with your forms and have an estate planning attorney evaluate them. Okay, so is the value of your home, which is paid off, count towards the $100,000 in assets? Uh, assets are all question mark. Uh, I don't know what that means quite, but if you, so there is probate if you own any real estate in your own name. If you have a $5,000 parking space and you die and that's your only asset, probate will be required because you own real estate, period. If you have $100,000 plus, whether that's, if you have $120,000 in a single bank account, or you have three bank accounts that have $40,000. If they're not under trust, they don't list a beneficiary who outlives you, probate would be required in that scenario too.
Somebody is asking, how do I locate individuals who may act as my power of attorney for healthcare decisions so my adult son does not need to be involved? Uh, most estate planning attorneys do have lists of people or may be able to obtain them. Um, I don't give them out, but almost every estate planning attorney would be able to refer you to somebody, uh, assuming you're a client. Uh, once I execute power of attorney will trust, how can I make sure that I'm aware of new laws that are introduced that require changes to my documents? Have a good lawyer. Uh, there's no place that really will tell you what all the new laws are. Uh, I spend thousands of dollars every year and a lot of time at continuing legal education. I've got two bookshelves my, my height and I'm a little over six feet filled of only estate planning and probate and guardianship books. And every few years I have to update them, uh, reprint them according to the new laws. Uh, somebody else asking uh, a similar question before. My name is Loretta. Just wondering if I have to put my children's name in my condo in order for them to inherit it when they die, when I die. Um, a will and or a will and a trust would probably be a better avenue than listing them as a on your deed, but I don't know for your specific situation. Sometimes listing it may be a, an okay idea, but usually it's a bad idea. Uh, another person is asking, is it necessary to have a detailed list of assets spelled out in the living revocable trust? Um, no, uh, usually a living revocable trust says, you know, I give all of my personal property to X and perhaps all of my money to Y or perhaps it's also to X or to multiple people. Um, usually I like my clients to provide me a list of where their assets are and what they have. So in the event that somebody dies, we don't spend years looking for their money because I've had that happen where I've had to look for, sometimes uh, it took me a trust company and the CPA over two years to find somebody's assets because they were scattered all over the place and there was no you know, master list. That doesn't have to be included in the trust, but should be included somewhere. Otherwise, a lot of money and time will be spent trying to find it. Is it different to sell a house that was in a trust and one that is not in a trust? A little bit. Um, the biggest, there are a few ma minor things, usually when you sell it, as opposed to it saying the owner is John Smith, the seller is the John Smith Trust. There may be some other uh, ancillary forms that do need to be filed. Um, usually estate planning attorneys who do this, uh, we usually know how to do it. Most qualified real estate attorneys who have been doing it for a while could do it too. Okay, uh, in my process for preparing a living revocable trust, do I permit the client to review a final draft before we execute for corrections or changes? Yes, uh, usually when I'm done doing an estate plan, it's usually a little bit of a process. They have to hire me, sign a contract, uh, pay half of the fees, um, fill out some information for me, who they want to receive their money, who will be making their healthcare and financial decisions in the event of their disability or death. Um, I prepare the forms, I mail them drafts, either email or physical mail, or they pick it up just depending. And uh, then they review it, they tell me if there are any questions, corrections, and then we sign it. Do I prepare transfer on death instruments uh, if I wanna list my adult son as the beneficiary of my home? Uh, there is something in Illinois, it's only been around for a few years called a transfer on death instrument. Um, most other attorneys and myself, we're not huge fans of them. Uh, unlike a trust, it's very questionable. And the problem is, so you've named one person, let's say your child, but if there are multiple people, um, A, it's a problem because if there are multiple people, then you have two people that own a house as opposed to a will or a trust where one person's controlling it and two or more people may get the proceeds from when it's being sold. Um, that's always very difficult. That's usually where litigation comes in. And even if you only have one child, well, what happens if he passes away? 
Do you have grandchildren? How is it going to be held for a minor? A living revocable trust will usually prepare for a lot more. Transfer on death instruments were usually used for, um, I thought it was a poorly thought out thing by the legislature and oftentimes used by um, individuals and attorneys who really don't focus in this area of the law or have a thorough understanding of it. Will you please address any specific issues or concerns that have arisen related to the current pandemic crisis? Well, A, a lot of people who never did anything or didn't update their plans are a lot more nervous because they put it off forever. And I've got a lot of calls from people who want to do their estate planning now or want to finish it or want to update it. Um, as far as the crisis is concerned, nothing else is really different. Signing is a little bit more challenging, but as I pointed out before, uh, earlier still completely doable if you want to get it done and really a great time to do it as most of people are currently stuck at home uh, you have no um, there's probably no better time to actually at least start doing your estate planning than there is now so don't see any other uh, questions at the moment um, Barb I don't know if any were emailed or directed to you personally no I think that you answered all of them um... So give everybody one more minute if they want to add a question. Oh, there's one hand raised. Okay, hold on just a moment. All right, uh, is that okay with you? Uh, I don't know how to get to the hand raising part. Pardon? Uh, I, I can't read what they're okay. doing right. with the all right, hold on, let me, uh... okay, Robert, you have a question? Oh, hold on a second, sorry. Yeah, if you do have a question, if you can put it on the chat, it... let's see. Yeah, I'm not able to, hold on. We have one hand raised, what oh. amounts of assets require a trust? Um, there's no requirement, you can have $20 million and not have a trust, there's no requirement. Um, Usually if you have $100,000 or more on your real estate, if you want to avoid probate, you're gonna need that. But I've even had clients who have had less money who just wanna make sure that probate can be avoided, but also it's a way if you have multiple beneficiaries and possibly creditors to make sure there's one person in control, it doesn't have to go through court. Um, it's really a case by case basis. So there's no, you know, as I said, you could have any monetary amount and use a trust or not. I mean, if you have $50,000 in cash, you probably, you might not want to pay for a trust, but you might consider a will because probate won't be required. But as I said, depends on your specific situation. Did not receive the handouts. Uh, I guess that one's for you. <laughs> yep, I will take that. And I am having trouble. It says talking permitted, but the microphone is muted. So I'm not sure. Okay. Why this is and not I have one more question. Uh, somebody said, I have a living revocable trust paired uh, eight years ago. Am I comfortable reviewing an older trust and updating it to comply with the current laws? Yes. Um, however, every estate planning attorney updating somebody else's work, we're pretty much going to replace the estate plan. You don't have to take the assets out of the trust, but we're going to redo it because usually it's going to take too much time to review every provision at our hourly rate, it would cost you much more to do that. And no attorney wants to take liability for what another attorney did before. Because if we update and just change a couple provisions, um, you know, then we take liability on for what somebody else did. So usually it's going to be a redo, you know, especially if somebody says, I want to, you know, I want to change this. This is not what I wanted. Or it's probably a good yeah. thing, you know, if your attorney hasn't contacted you in eight years and there have been changes to the Power of Attorney Act and to the trust laws and to the IRAs and you haven't heard from them in that long, uh, it probably means you need a new lawyer. Okay, um, looks like Deborah still has her hand up. I'm not sure if okay. she's asked a couple questions now, so... 
Okay, so I have two more questions I saw and I'll take yeah. these and I guess this will probably be it. Okay. So uh, why does a simple will have to go through probate? Well, A, you, you can ask the Illinois legislature on that. Uh, I'm not in charge of that. But one of the major reasons is if you own assets in your own name um, and you have a will, though, when you died, there is no entity controlling it. The court has to um, say what's going to happen. And if you have any real estate or $100,000 or more, that does not list a beneficiary, the court views that the creditors and your heirs have the right to be notified to put in a claim so that they can get paid. Otherwise, somebody could just steal the money or it might be there indefinitely at the treasurer's website. If you do a trust and you properly plan ahead, um, probate can be avoided. Now, do all wills go through probate if you have them? No, there might be other ways to do it with, uh, it just depends how many beneficiaries you have. It depends on your situation and what's recommended. Some people try to say, okay, I've got, you know, $500,000 in a bank account. I've got two kids. I'll list them both as beneficiaries and then it doesn't go through probate. Well, that's great, but when there are creditors, one of your kids has spent the money, there's $100,000 in bills, that creditor sues the one who still has some money left and they'll get it all because the other one is now broke. As opposed to if it went through probate through a will or if you had it through a trust, the creditor takes the 100,000 and then they each get their 200,000 to do what they want with it. Um, let's see, and another one is, if I have a new trust, will I have to redo the deeds to a home and rental properties? No, you can still leave them in the old trust. It's usually, if there's a trust, there's something called an amendment and restatement. Basically, uh, you don't have to change them as long as they were done correctly when they were originally put in. Uh, I've got another question. Do all bank accounts have to be placed in the name of the trust? And can you once again clarify if IRAs need to be part of the trust or if you can just leave it with beneficiaries, identify what the company is? You can do either. What's best for you, I don't know without seeing your estate plan and what you want to do. Um, that's not really one I can answer and that's giving legal advice. So I can't really tell you exactly what should be done with your plan. Is there a law requiring our trust and will to have been prepared in past number of years? No, you could have a 80 year old will and or trust, but if it's that old, uh, expect there to be some problems. So uh, that's all for today's program. I hope you all enjoyed the program. Uh, I believe Barb will have this up as a recorded program for the Arlington Heights Memorial Library website. And uh, I may possibly be back later this year or next year in person or video, depending on the pandemic. That's right. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob. This was a great program. Um, the video uh, won't be up right away, but uh, it will be on the library's YouTube channel. So it's Arlington Heights Memorial Library on YouTube, and that's where it will be posted. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for all of your great questions. And I hope you enjoyed the program. And thank you again, Jacob. Okay, thank you very much, Barb. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye.